key advantage of dynamic market systems is that they are very good in creating incentives for people to solve basic coordination problems. How do we bring buyers and sellers together who can profitably interact but may not be able to find each other, who may not know about each other? So we see a wide array of businesses who effectively set out to solve these core informational problems. It can be something so simple as matching the buyers and sellers. Historically, this has been quite analog, for example. Typically, newspapers had uh, buy and sell columns of advertising. People who wanted to list something for sale could simply take out a classified advertisement and advertise their boat, their car, their bike, or whatever, uh, sometimes to give things away. Um, if you're looking for a new owner for your for a pet because you have to move overseas, for example, all of all of these kinds of things, uh, you just simply need to find another party who has complementary interests, and it can be so simple as an analog share. Of course, when we move digitally, it has uh, advantages of speediness, uh, obviously greater distributional uh, reach. We can reach across geographical space. But also the other huge advantage of things being digital is it allows very effective search. And so then we need a range of things such as tagging and classifications and categories and whatnot. And there's a lot of very smart people in IT who've evolved a whole range of solutions for this. Digital approaches also allow us to do interesting things like create platforms that allow for user reviews, which help to further overcome many of these informational problems. There's a huge array of facilitation services, hotel booking sites, ride share apps, um, online auctions are the most obvious. They're a natural extension of those analog classified uh, advertisements we've spoken about earlier. Um, dating apps, all of those things that we are familiar with. There's lots of uh, variation in the extent to which we can take advantage of things like the user review function. If we look at sites such as uh, Wikipedia or Booking.com, we can say this is absolutely critical to their appeal as platforms. That you can search uh, a town, city, place, wherever you want to stay, and you can sort by price range, you can then sort by facilities, by location, and you can sort by user reviews. Moreover, you can also bore down into the subgroup of users. So, for example, in Booking.com, there's the capacity to search by user reviews that are families or single travel travelers, gay and lesbian travelers, for example, whatever your particular subcategory is. Uh, I think we're only at the very beginning of the potentiality of some of these digital-based facilitation services. It won't be long, for example, before you're able to effectively upload, or perhaps through your social media profiles, upload a profile of what your own tastes and preferences are, and then to search for, for example, hotels or bicycles, holiday destinations, furniture or whatever, um, based on things that other people who like what I like, liked. So if you're able to put up your favorite brands, if you've done, for example, a personal kind of brand audit of the things that you connect with that reflect your tastes, uh, it won't be long, I suspect, before you can actually go and do a search, say for hotels, based on other people who share your taste in, say, Scandi mid-century minimalism, and it will give you, at the top of your search, the properties that best reflect your personal uh, preferences. So we can see enormous range of potentiality when we just start to get a little bit creative about these things. Imagine a dating site where other people who've dated you could actually rate you like booking.com where people people can rate hotel booking sites. That's a bit of a scary prospect. Um, but uh, maybe it would also overcome some of the problems of be people behaving very, very badly um, after meeting other people through uh, dating sites if they knew that they could be reviewed and maybe even black banned 
for example, as we see with uh, Uber, where complaints about both customers and drivers create an interesting dynamic. So one thing we need to keep in mind, though, is who gets paid and uh, who is paying and as a consequence, what kind of incentives exist. There's a the huge array of facilitators we understand, real estate agents, for example, travel agents, all of these um, services are providing the facilitative function. They have to get paid. So how do they get paid? Now, if you join one of those dating services that very proactively try to match people for the serious intent of getting married, and you pay quite a lot of money to join the dating club or whatever, the typical pattern is that both parties pay, and so these are neutral facilitators. We can see a range of businesses that are either getting paid by both sides, or even if they're paid by one side, nonetheless very much see themselves as having a neutral role because the reputation of their platform depends on this. For example, the hotel booking sites, although they get paid by the hotel, critical to the attractiveness of the, the booking site is the fact that the site itself is seen to be relatively neutral in relation to the property. Or at very least, if it's not directly neutral, uh, it provides those reviews which give an, uh, a neutral or an independent collective and uh, obviously individual review level feedback based on which the customers can make choices about which hotels they want to book. Now, of course, we do see booking sites that will uh, have recommendations that will push some, some hotels over others, and typically that's because they're getting a larger margin, for example. But there are a lot of ethical issues there, and that's why sometimes we see government regulation. One role of facilitation where this is a big issue is actually in education services, where we have education agents. People are thinking who are study, thinking we're studying abroad in another country might go to an agent and ask them to recommend, to suggest some universities abroad. Now, one of the ugly realities in the higher education business is that there is a lot of competition between universities to pay commissions to agents. And some unethical agents will sometimes recommend a university or a college to a potential student, not based on the best fit between the institution and the student, but based more on the size of the uh, agent commission that the institution is, is uh, prepared to pay the agent. So the agent makes more money by representing university uh, or introducing university B over university A. In financial services, this is also another big problem. Real estate, uh, to some lesser degree, because generally in real estate in many countries, we have standard form contracts, standard commissions. So the amount that the real estate agent gets paid is the same uh, as a percentage of the sale, uh, regardless of the particular house that they sell. But there's a very important point there. I just said regardless of the house that they sell. This raises the big set of issues about facilitation from a customer point of view. So is it a neutral facilitation function or is the platform getting paid, the facilitator getting paid by one side of the tra to the transaction uh, who is clearly in a principal agent relationship with that one side of the transaction? Now, that's fine. The person has to get paid. But the other side who's not paying for the service has to always keep in mind who is paying. Now, to go back to the example of the online hotel booking service, generally we have good reason to think that, for example, Booking.com or Expedia, for example, or a range of other similar services such as Hotels.com and whatnot, uh, that their reputation for platform neutrality will overcome any short-term temptations of recommending some hotels over others, maybe through putting them higher in search, simply based on 
getting paid a higher margin. If on the other hand you're buying a house, uh, although the real estate agent has a whole range of properties that they're representing and they're paid between uh, the same regardless of which one they sell to you, at the end of the day they're getting paid to sell you a property and you're not paying the agent. So the agent is invariably going to act in the interests of the vendor. This is why we see in some countries in the case of real estate that people who are looking to buy a property, to buy a house, will engage a buyer's agent. And the buyer's agent typically is expert in market conditions, has a fair uh, sense of what the market price is, and is very experienced in negotiating. So the buyer's agent will negotiate with the seller's agent, and of course, uh, each party will pay the, uh, the agent's uh, fees, mirroring who they act for. We do see a bit of an odd situation in Japan where there is normally a buyer's agent and a seller's agent arrangement, a, a commission arising for both, but uh, very often the seller's agent actually nominally is carrying out both functions, and so you typically get uh, a bill for both of the the uh, commissions, uh, but in fact the agent has very much functioned on the uh, the side of the seller. So always keep in mind that principal agent relationship. Uh, typically, who is paying is the principal, and the person who is receiving the payment uh, will be the agent of the principal, and that's all right if they are providing the platform for the other side as well to use, as long as the other side keeps in mind that effectively they're getting this facilitation function for free, but the downside is that the, uh, the other party is paying the facilitator, therefore one has to be very careful in guarding your own interests, in being an effective negotiator, in effectively considering all of your options and that's really what makes those kind of facilitation sites and businesses uh, so important and so attractive to us anyway. We can't do this stuff by ourselves. We do have to go to a real estate agent, for example, to find a place to rent or buy. Um, we just need to keep in mind that if we are the buyer and we walk into a real estate agent uh, want to uh, buy an apartment, for example, that they will be being paid by the vendor, so we will have to be very, very careful to protect our own interests, even when we're dealing with this agent who seems so lovely and maybe even give us a bunch of flowers on the day that we move in.